everyone and as I said tonight we are going to talk about uh, money and we are going to talk about uh, international monetary systems but I'm going to start this presentation uh, with this particular slide because I think that uh, it's a very very powerful one and if you take a snapshot of this one if you write it down uh, then you will have a chance to check every single big financial crisis that happened in the world since uh, 1929 to current time. Uh, how many of those crises um, or countries uh, during that time of crisis were actually going on and having all those particular characteristics, which is high inflation, uh, which is widening current account deficit, excessive expansion of domestic borrowing, and asset price inflation. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that pretty much every single crisis since Great Depression to nowadays had most of the time all of these factors, and very often at least most of those factors. So for all of you who are thinking about uh, uh, where do I go, where do I invest money in the world and all of those things and can I predict when the potential crisis is going to happen? Well, uh, start searching for these indicators and if you see that most of them are there, be on a very, very serious alert because the crisis may actually happen there. And I'm going to start first with 1994 and Mexican peso crisis. Uh, last week we were talking about regional economic integrations and we talked about NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, and basically that was negotiation were going on in 93 and uh, there were a lot of optimism going on in the region and in the world about this particular regional grouping and since Mexico was one of those member countries of NAFTA, Mexico was uh, expected to benefit from the, from the new uh, regional economic integration. And uh, there were a lot of uh, investment pouring into Mexico, different type of investment coming from different countries. But in particular, there were a lot of portfolio investments. Last week and I think two weeks ago, we were talking about uh, different types of investment. And we said there, is foreign, there are foreign direct investment when the company is investing in another country, either by buying already existing company through mergers and acquisition, or by literally starting through greenfield projects, building a factory, building a company, and all of those. So that's one type of investment. However, I'm going to talk here, and in Mexico what was happening was mostly portfolio investment. So there was no building, there was no something material that you can touch, you can feel, you can see. It was really investment on the stock market. And what is the characteristic of this portfolio investment? Do you maybe happen to know? How are they different than foreign direct investment? How easy is to divest? Sell them. So which one you can sell faster? Portfolio investment or foreign direct investment? Uh, portfolio investment. Well, absolutely right. Yes, we can sell very fast portfolio investment because we are just in the stock market. We have a broker. We said sell it and it's gone. And I can cash in. Very good. Now, uh, with all of this on our minds, let's start thinking about what was happening with this Mexican peso crisis. 1994, we have uh, presidential elections are supposed to happen in, 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 in Mexico. One of the leading presidential candidates was assassinated, killed. So obviously when you have uh, such an event, it had a very negative political risk uh, consequences, so people, potential investors, started doubting 
Mexico. What's going to happen? Is it going to be a chaos? I mean, they just killed their presidential candidate. So that was a very, very serious event. Uh, event number two was that there were uh, on the on the south of the country there were um, uprising of the particular group that was very unhappy with their position in the Mexican society. Again, another political event that was having very negative consequences on the stock market. And number three was uh, uh, really uh, a terrible earthquake, which happened, which again meant that the economy was going down, there was a destruction, and all those th three things combined gave you an idea that investors were starting to be a little, little bit nervous about staying on Mexican market. On the top of all of that, what happened is, like at the end of the of the year, uh, Mexican government announced that the, the their well, currency peso is going to devaluate. So again, uh, when you have a situation of potential for the currency to go down, how do you feel as investor? Are you happy that the currency is going to devaluate or not happy? <laughs> okay, uh, you're thinking correctly. Yes, I mean, obviously, the investors don't like their currency to go down because usually what happens, I have my own uh, Russian ruble. I exchange my rubles and I invest in Mexican market. I'm investing there in Mexican pesos. Now, that Mexican pesos is going down. What does that mean? How much ruble I'm going to get? Less, more than I invested? I'm going to get less because, you know, like I just lost 14% because their currency went down. And of course, they want to exchange pesos and bring back to ruble and, and then buy, you know, that wonderful shuba that will help me here in, to survive this, this cold weather. Now, it's not only that they predicted 14%, but obviously, as I put it here, that was like really giving a negative impact on the investors. They start to be very, very nervous. And at the end of the day, meaning in early 1995, it's not that, the, it's not that their currency lost 14, but it lost Sorok 40%. So quite a significant decline. And uh, let's see this video. Uh, Deepen today with stocks dropping sharply and the peso still under fire. A government austerity plan announced yesterday and billions of dollars in assistance from the U.S. and others apparently have not bolstered the confidence of investors. Here's ABC's Bob Jamis. There was such panic on the Mexican stock market that some brokers advised their clients to sell regardless of the law. When the trading ended, the market had lost another 7% of its value. This year alone, Mexican stocks have fallen 20%. A similar loss here would equal a 750-point drop on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. At one point, the Mexican market looked like a meltdown. That was only one blow to Americans who had $53 billion invested in the Mexican stock market before the crisis. The peso also continued to collapse. It has lost 40% of its value to the dollar in the last three weeks. And the crisis has grown despite $10 billion in aid from the United States and Canada, Mexico's partners in NAFTA. It erupted when the government of new President Ernesto Zedillo announced wage and price controls and spending cuts to deal with Mexico's economic problems. The country has a growing trade deficit, huge foreign debt, and soaring inflation. It also has $7 billion in short-term bonds coming due in the next three weeks, much of them held by American investors. Economists say that should not be the only concern about America's second biggest trading partner. Mexican goods will be a lot more competitive in the American market and American goods will be a lot less competitive in the Mexican market, which could cost a job for American companies selling into Mexico. This economic turmoil is hardest on Mexico's population, and officials worry there will now be a sudden increase in Mexican migration to the United States, which will put even more pressure on the American job market. Bob Jamison, ABC News, New York.
In Washington today, President Clinton said that the economic crisis in Mexico is far too severe and its impact on the U.S. far too important to wait for Congress to make up its mind. And so Mr. Clinton has acted on his own to shore up Mexico's currency, the peso. He reached into a special government fund for which he needs no congressional approval. At the White House tonight, ABC's Brit Hume. Congressional leaders were summoned to the White House this morning where the president informed them privately in a meeting in the cabinet room what he had decided to do about what they had told him last night. Namely, that Congress might eventually approve that $40 billion loan guarantee for Mexico, but not anytime soon. The president announced what he decided to do publicly later in a meeting with the nation's governors. Because Congress cannot act now, I have worked with other countries to prepare a new package. As proposed now, it will consist of a $20 billion share from the United States' Exchange Stabilization Fund, which we can authorize by executive action without a new act of Congress. That $20 billion in reserve U.S. funds the president decided to use for Mexico is only half the amount he had asked Congress for. But combined with more than $17 billion in additional funds, the administration rounded up from international lending institutions, officials said... Mexico will have about the same total amount to help stabilize the sinking peso. In our judgment, the financial distress had reached the point where it was absolutely imperative that the president act and act now. And that was very much the president's view and the view of the bipartisan leadership this morning. Relieved congressional leaders were only too happy to confirm that. I'll be sending a letter to the president this afternoon along with Gingrich and uh, Tom Daschle and Gephardt, in effect, supporting the president's position so he won't be out there by himself. Dole and other congressional leaders like this new Clinton plan because of what it does do and what it does not do. It does help rescue Mexico from a financial collapse they believe could have shaken the U.S. economy. But it does not force Congress to vote on what looks suspiciously to the U.S. public like a $40 billion taxpayer finance bailout. Rich Hume, ABC News, the White House. Well, the news that President Clinton was acting now gave the Mexican stock market and the Mexican currency quite a boost. And this is important for the U.S. economy. ABC's John Donovan explains the connection. Mexico was supposed to be one relationship the White House and Wall Street could sit back and enjoy. Then a year ago, the trouble began. An armed rebellion in the Mexican South. A candidate assassinated during Mexico's presidential campaign. As nervous foreign investors pulled money out of Mexican stocks and banks, the Mexican government began spending its dollars to buy pesos to keep their value high so Mexicans could continue to spend their way toward a better standard of living. But last month, the Mexican government ran short of dollars and the peso crashed. So did Mexico's stock market. And 92 million Mexicans, who as a nation represent America's third largest customer, had lost nearly half their purchasing power overnight. Mexico's troubles have crossed the border already, with tens of thousands of American jobs at stake in companies that make products Mexicans buy. With the peso's value reduced almost by half, they're buying a lot less. At Burban Incorporated, for example, which ships rawhide south from San Antonio. I have stopped practically delivering hides to Mexico. That's it. Because of the, mo the money not coming in for the, the hides that they owe me in Mexico. His business is down 40% this month. Business can shut down. And it's a small business. And there's a lot of other small businesses in the same situation. Big business is also getting hurt. Walmart, the largest retailer in America, has halted a 25-store expansion into Mexico since the peso crashed. And Chrysler says its sales in Mexico are down 75% for January. That threatens thousands of American auto workers who make parts for Chrysler's sold in Mexico. It has a ripple effect onto the other parts of our business. It may not be easy for people to see that, but I, I can assure you it is, it is real. And while the president is warning of the risk to jobs, thousands of Americans have also invested up to $20 billion in Mexico's stock market. Not only Wall Street firms, but many small investors and pension plans who own shares in mutual funds that buy Mexican stocks and bonds. That puts people's savings at risk. I can't afford to wait out uh, for it to straighten out, which is why I had to sell my, my stocks. 
Wall Street and the White House share this nightmare, that the turmoil in Mexico will spread to other developing countries, hurt their currencies, and affect even more American workers and investors and the U.S. dollar. It is the domino theory applied to Mexico, money, and markets. John Donvan, ABC News, New York. Sorry, sorry. Uh, all of these things were happening uh, in the case of Mexico when the Mexican tequila crisis struck. So now I would like to hear from some of you. Um, why do you think that United States, uh, particularly the President of the United States, was very fast uh, uh, in his reaction to help Mexico get out of this crisis? Why did he do this? my opinion, it's because of it's a lot of manufacturers of the American companies in uh, located in uh, Mexico. So, and uh, of course, it's a lot of investing. And uh, actually, I think it's like because of human resources too. Because it's a lot. I think it's a lot of uh, Americans who work in. Work in uh, uh, American companies, which located in Mexico. Uh, they may not necessarily be working a lot of Americans working in Mexico, but there were a lot of Americans working in the United States in the companies that were exporting <laughs> to Mexico. I know that that's what you meant to say, but just to clarify, anybody else can say, like, why did the U.S. president act it the way he did, even without uh, uh, the approval of the of the Congress, he was entitled to do that. But why did he why did he do that? <laughs> well, I guess because he should had a very urgent urgent decision, because uh, as crisis develops, it uh, will be much uh, harder to stop it uh, to decline it and uh, as Constantine said uh, there are a lot of overlapping companies which I take uh, which I make business uh, in uh, both with the USA and Mexico and if uh, crisis will try to Mexican companies it will also reflect to USA one very good. And you probably remember that uh, uh, middle-aged woman when she said that I had my investment and portfolio investment on their stock market and I actually had to sell it because I didn't want to lose more than I'm already losing. So there are a lot of pension funds and a lot of mutual mutual funds that invested uh, in, in Mexico as, as well. Uh, obviously, this is, I think, a very good example <clears throat> when we see that... Uh, uh, there is an interrelation between the countries. And again, Mexico is the, the second or the third largest uh, uh, market for American products. So definitely very, very significant impact on the United States. I want to just say something that is interesting, that United States did provide this, uh, assess, uh, this assistance. But believe it or not, actually Mexico repaid that loan much faster than it was due. So they did really did their share of the bargain. So I just wanted to. Uh, and again, uh, one very, very important thing is uh, this was the first time in the history of the uh, international financial market that we have a first international portfolio investment crisis. So in a certain way, we didn't have any pre-knowledge about what can happen on the market and what, got, what can be the effects of uh, this huge influx of portfolio investment 
And then definitely after this crisis, we got some better understanding and maybe we should be getting some uh, better prepared to react on, on those sort of things. Uh, and also what we learned from this crisis that it is really, really important to have some safety net, uh, some buffer uh, that will help us overcome the consequences of the, of the crisis. And then as foreign capital influx, we were talking a few weeks ago, is, can have a very positive effect on the growth one economy because it can provide new jobs, it can provide uh, new potential foreign markets for export. Too much foreign capital can also have a negative impact on inflation because it can trigger inflation, which is really uh, can have a very, very bad consequences on the economy. Now, since this crisis happened, uh, the next crisis is going to move us really, really far away. And that one is going to happen in Southeast Asia in 1997. Uh, the first country that is going to be affected by this crisis is going to be Thailand. And again, like with the case of Mexican peso crisis, the tequila crisis, that taught us something about the negative consequences of huge portfolio investment. This crisis is going to teach us the importance of uh, developing financial institutions before we liberalize financial markets. And all of those are characteristics and consequences of the crisis, but I'm going to go through that crisis a little bit more. And again, as I said, this crisis did teach us the importance of developing financial institutions before we liberalize financial markets. What does that mean? Uh, we are in the mid of 90s. Uh, we have already uh, in the world economy uh, a lot of optimism going on regarding the liberalized market economies that they are going actually to give the best results to every every country and uh, for every economic development. However, what we were forgetting was that while uh, the Western society or so-called Washington consensus was promoting liberalization of trade, open your markets for imported products, open your markets for foreign investment. Uh, those particular markets were really not ready. Why? Because they didn't have institutions that were ready, that were prepared for that liberalized free market economy. In particular, in Asia, what happened was, uh, since the market, particularly financial markets, were open, there were a lot of, an, uh, a lot of investment going on uh, and a lot of borrowing, for that matter, from international financial markets. Now, Thailand was borrowing short term. So that means few months up to a year, short term borrowing. However, uh, Thailand was lending that money internally into the economy long term, which immediately should actually bring those red flags that something is going to go wrong because how can you borrow short term and then you land that long term? There is a discrepancy between those that you own foreigners and that you will actually get from your local people. And on the top of that, where that money mostly was going was in real estate. Why? Because of all of this optimism, because of all of this uh, expectation that Thailand as a new emerging market is going to grow so fast that there will be a lot of new foreign direct investment going on, that there will be a lot of tourists coming to Thailand, they start building a lot, buildings, houses. And all of those were supposed to give some revenues uh, once they were sold, but unfortunately some of them were never sold. Why? Because 
Thailand couldn't match its obligations toward foreign uh, foreign uh, lenders, and the current and the country is basically going to go down. Uh, Now, what happened in this case also was uh, uh, that uh, the Thai government promised fixed exchange rate to dollar. What does that mean for investors? For investors, that meant that they shouldn't be worrying about this devaluation that happened in Mexico, 40%. They shouldn't be worrying that they will be losing the money because the the local currency baht is the local currency baht is going to devaluate because government said we have enough foreign reserves we are going to defend baht don't worry invest it's safe investment on that note again even more capital flow because now the the the, the investors didn't need to worry about and this is what that term unhedged. Usually when you go to international financial market, usually when you invest your money, either on the stock, either on the, you know, like an, another, another way of investment, you will like, or if you just have uh, international trade in another currency, you will like to hedge your exchange rate exposure. What does that mean? In Russia, I'm paying my workers in what currency? Robles, of course. I'm also paying if I'm buying raw materials locally, I'm paying that in rubles. Okay. Now I have all my calculations made in rubles, but I'm going to sell this product, not in rubles. I'm going to sell this product in let's say euros. I made all my calculations regarding uh, like rubles and how much I need to make in order and charge in order to get you know particular revenue or profit. Then I price my product in euro. I sell my product in euro, but euro devaluates. Am I going to be happy with that? Why not? Let me what do it. Why not happy? Because you lost your wealth. You know, without doing anything, I did everything right. I made the product, I made the calculation, I made the calculation and transferred that in euros, converted that in euros, I made a contract, they paid me euros, so what's the problem? The problem is exchange rate, it just devaluated. So now when I have to transfer that money, and convert them in euros, uh, and convert them in rubles, I'm going actually to lose money. So in order to prevent this of happening, companies have an option to hedge against exchange rate risk. What does that mean? Hedging is another way of saying, I want to ensure myself that the worst case, in the worst case scenario, I wouldn't be losing money. And then I can actually buy a different contracts, different options that will actually hedge me against that foreign exchange risk. Of course, like any other insurance, hedging costs money. And it's then up to us to decide, am I willing to risk? Or I prefer safety, security, and I'm willing to pay for that insurance. In this particular case, the investors didn't hedge against any exchange rate risk because the government promised there wouldn't be any devaluation. And in Thailand and in the whole part of Southeast Asia, those countries were really dealing with some maybe poor risk management. And as I said, there was really not well-developed financial markets. There were really not developed uh, financial rules and regulations. So you can add by uh, giving loans to the partners that were really not able to repay. Because why? You didn't check their credibility. You didn't check their 
how much income they made, how much collateral they have, or something like that. Now, the whole things were even more uh, complicated that most of that lending to Thailand in particular came from Japan. And as long as Japan was doing well economically, they had enough money to send to, let's say, Thailand. And it was in their interest because then they were left getting interest for that. However, Japan entered in the most serious recession of their existence in a certain way. And they basically started to withdraw all of their loans from foreign countries to actually help economic development of Japan, which meant, remember, short-term borrowing from Thailand. But they landed that money long-term. Now the investors, Japanese, came and asked them, give us our money back. They didn't have money to give. So that's where we see that the country was entering a really, really serious crisis. And of course, any type of similar information gets very, very fast on the financial markets. And therefore, traders, investors started to panic. And they wanted to get out of this market as fast as possible. Oh, sorry. And eventually, International Monetary Fund did intervene, but unlikely, unlike like in the case of Mexico, where the intervention happened almost overnight, Thailand actually had to wait for money from International Monetary Fund. Why? Why the US, in particular, was so fast in reacting to Mexican crisis? And why U.S. and International Monetary Fund wasn't that fast to help Thailand in a similar situation. Okay. Uh, maybe this is because of time zones. I mean, like uh, USA and Mexico had uh, the same time zones. And uh, but uh, Asia and USA had different time zones, so uh, there were nights in the USA, and they uh, should wait uh, for a particular time in the USA. Then, uh, when uh, their phone will work. What does the time zone signifies also? Like, if there were so much, it's uh, probably 12 hours difference in time zone. So, what does that also tells you? How? versus Mexico being like the same time zone. What does that time zone's difference tell you also about? How close uh, geographically those countries are? <laughs> They're very far away from each other. Yes, Vladimir, you have to add something to this. OK, so it was the distance, OK. Maybe the USA weren't sure that uh, it will be helpful for them in the future. Uh, you are you are very actually close. Uh, Thailand and United States do have economic relations, and Thailand was actually very instrumental for United States during the Vietnam War because that was the place where uh, American soldiers were going to to hospitals to heal. Uh, but they don't have that strong economic relations like you know Mexico has. I mean, it's on, on the American border. So this was too far geographically, <clears throat> as, as that old saying goes, too far from too far from sight, too far from heart. And the United States didn't really see that this will have any particular um, a significant impact to United States and for that matter for the rest of the world. However, we actually did realize that that uh, uh, crisis that happened started in Thailand actually had a, a domino effect or a contagion effect and then it spread to South Korea and then it spread to some other parts of Southeast Asia. Now from here are some of the lessons that we learned from this Asian crisis. And they will be like, um, as I mentioned a few times already, 
we first have to develop strong financial system before we open our markets for actually investment of, of before we open our market and liberalize our financial markets. Uh, what also it says that uh, we have to encourage foreign direct investment versus portfolio investment because portfolio investment can can be very fast in, but it can also leave the country very fast. And that can have very negative effects on the economy. And finally, we also discovered we can't have it all, unfortunately, life also, uh, in that sense that we can have only two of those three characteristics. We can have either a fixed exchange rate, which the government on Thailand was promising. We are promising the currency is not going to devaluate. And we can have free international flows of capital, which Thai government was also having. However, we can't have an independent monetary policy. Okay, too fast. Or we can have independent monetary policy and uh, uh, free international flows, but we can't have fixed exchange rate. So the whole point is you have to pick and choose. You can't promise and deliver upon all of those three at the same time, unfortunately. And now the big question, as you know, I mean, financial uh, fin investors, financial investors are, as they move from South, uh, South Korea, as they move their money from Thailand, as they move their money from Malaysia, as they move their money from Indonesia, they're not going to keep their money in their pocket. They have to move that money and to put somewhere else. So what do you think? Where did they put that money now next? Where did the money go? Okay, one option is China. Okay, where else did it go? <laughs> where else? <laughs> what do you think? What was another market? We are now in 1998. What is another emerging country with a very high yield on the stock market in 1998? I'm sure that you know that country very well. Russia, <laughs> yes. Now, the money that was actually leaving Mexico went to uh, Southeast Asia. Now is going to Russia. And I will like now to see the video about Russia. I want you to see this video because it is, it is from Russia today, so you can see from Russian perspective about Russian crisis in 1998 and how did it uh, 
look like and what were the consequences. And uh, I think it's also a very, very good clip about never forgetting history and uh, hopefully we wouldn't be making the same mistakes as we made in the past. like that we have an audio problem with this particular one, but uh, basically what they're uh, talking in this video and showing is really how fast the prices were changing on a, on a daily basis and how uh, really hard it was for a lot of people who lost their jobs. And there was even one personal story about one young guy that you may actually relate to him. He was only 22. He came to Moscow with his family to start a new family, hoping uh, that he will have enough money uh, to rent a place and start a new life. But actually, he just discovered that with all money that he brought with him, he only had enough money for for one dinner for his I family. Banking analyst. Okay. <laughs> no, Ten years ago, Yevgeny was selling groceries. Nikiforov says people back then just couldn't afford anything but food for themselves. When Russia's economy was struck by the 1998 economic crisis, retail prices were rising by the hour, and storekeepers rushed to provide more merchandise as customers started sweeping everything off the shelves. The turnover was extremely high. Those goods which were not in demand for months sold out in five days. The best-selling products were matches and salts followed by all kinds of tins. The so-called ruble crisis hit Russia on August 17th of 1998. It was preceded and triggered by the Asian financial crisis. The annual inflation rate rose to 84%, undermining the ruble and devastating the economy. Russia looks different now. The country's booming economy helped create thousands of construction sites and making it possible for many Russians to invest in real estate. But in August of 1998, some of them lost everything. Alexei Klavchenko still remembers his personal tragedy. A 22-year-old man at the time, he was hoping to move from his small town to Moscow to start a new life. Three days before the crisis, Alexei left his house for rent and traveled to the capital together with his family. The Kravchenkos were shocked to find out that the money they had was not enough for one single dinner. The crisis ended the possibility of moving my family here quickly. This was my first family, which fell apart soon after, partly because I was unable to ensure financial stability at that time. Banking analysts doubt that a crisis of such massive scale could be repeated in modern Russia. They say there are laws to protect people's investments, their accounts are insured, and the whole financial system is more secure than it was in 1998. But most experts we spoke to agree the fear is still there. Polls indicate that many people are still afraid of another crisis. Sometimes I get questions, even from well-educated and quite prosperous people, whether we may be on the verge of another currency devaluation. As Russia's economy is on the rise, it looks like there are not many reasons for people to distrust their government's financial policies. But as many Russians still remember the 1998 ruble crisis, they say they have learned its lessons. For entrepreneurs and for thousands of investors, it was an introduction to the market economy and the idea that money can be lost as well as made. Denis Bolotsky, RT, Krasnodar region. Okay, so that was that and today is a completely different situation.
But I think that this was really important uh, for you to see how it was, and it's always good to see it from the people who really had the first-hand experience. Constanti, do you maybe know somebody who went through this crisis? You want to listen to the story? Um, okay. Uh, one of my friends, uh, like one of the guy, of my friend, uh, the guy which worked with me in my last job. So he had a friend. It was some like businessman, and he had a business in a like uh, transport things, uh, uh, the the hard transport equipment and uh, he lost a lot of money on this crisis and actually he lost his mind. Yeah. And then thank you for sharing that because you know sometimes uh, we are so much focused on numbers and we are forgetting that uh, behind those numbers uh, really there are their personal stories and and thank you for sharing that that one thank you uh, now, since, uh, uh -huh, uh, just a second, just a second, I want to show you here. I just want to show you, not the best one, but this is actually, if you look, this is uh, how uh, the valuation of Russia and Rubla. So 1997 in December, this is where it was, and then you see, actually it went here in March, April, then it actually dropped to this level in July, uh, just in like uh, six, seven months, and then it's keep dropping down until the November, and then it slightly started to pick up uh, and stabilize at a much lower level in December of uh, 1998. And uh, this was actually the drop of GDP. Uh, this was uh, 97, and then you see how huge the drop of this GDP was. And again, each time when we have a drop in GDP, that means a lot of unemployment and a lot of similar and actually painful stories like Constantin share with us. Uh, um, I want to point out to this particular thing, and I think I mentioned to that uh, to a few of you a little bit more about this before. But uh, uh, definitely, Russia was very attractive financial uh, center in 1998. Uh, what was also uh, attractive was that there was a notion that Russia being uh, coming from Soviet Union and Soviet Union being a very strong state that uh, the, the, strong, the same strong state will apply in the case of Russia which in this particular case meant that the Russian government will never allow uh, like Soviet Union government will never allow for, for the country to actually default on its obligations and this is what this uh, line is basically saying that at one point financial uh, markets uh, were unable to determine who is in charge. They were thinking that it was Russian government on the stock market. Uh, they were not quite sure that those were private investors or the stock market on its own. But actually, Russia is going to kind of default on its obligations and devaluate the ruble. And this is that... Uh, 90 day moratorium on foreign credit repayment that uh, you know refusing to repay obligations and then again uh, Duma reject uh, to accept the measures that would be designed to alleviate problems obviously a lot of lot of things were happening in such a short period of time and now since money has to go somewhere else money went to south uh, south america and in South America, we have Argentina. How many of you have ever been to Argentina? No, okay. I guess the place to visit, definitely. Sorry? Yes, I've been there and I have been teaching there as well. And I just came, I was teaching there, I think it was uh, in uh, June. So, yeah, recently, this year. Okay, so Argentina uh, has, uh, like the whole continent almost, for a number of years, they were struggling 
uh, with a very, very high inflation rate. And uh, they, they were then thinking, how, what can we do in order to give the signal to the markets that the currency is going to be stable and then it's safe to invest in Argentina? And they came with an idea to create a currency board. I don't know if any of you have heard about currency board. But I will, once I finish this one, I will switch to different, different ways how the currency, what type of the currency exchange uh, systems we may have. Currency board basically means the following. Okay. Argentina doesn't have a good reputation with stable currency. Doesn't have a good uh, reputation with low inflation rate. <clears throat> so what are they going to do to give a signal to the market that really this is a stable country with a stable currency and with a low inflation. Currency board is pretty much going to give uh, all, uh, all positive answers to those questions. Why? Because currency board means that you can print your own currency only in the amount of the foreign reserve currency you have. What does that mean? That means that uh, Argentina had in its own reserves, let's pick a number, 13, 15, 20, let's say million, billion, doesn't matter, uh, dollars. So they can only print equivalent of those dollars in Argentine pesos. So every peso has, peso has to be backed up, linked, supported, by the dollar in their foreign reserves. If they do that, that means there wouldn't be any inflation because the country, the government cannot simply print the money. Only if you have reserves in foreign currency, you can then print that much money. The only way how Argentina can increase the quantity of money is by exporting because then they will be earning the foreign currency and some of that currency they can put in their reserves. So sounds very, very good, and it was really, really working for quite some time until we have this crisis in, you know, starting from Mexico, going to Southeast Asia, then going through uh, so, uh, Russia, and then basically coming to Brazil, and Argentina was stuck. And as I said, all of this was happening. Now, everything was working as long as the dollar wasn't strong. Why? Because if I am pegging my currency to the currency that is not increasing in its value, then my product that I want to sell on international markets are going to be very competitive. However, two things happened to Argentina. Number one is that the dollar, the value of dollar started to go up. So then the value of Argentine peso had to go up. How is that going to affect Argentine export? Is export going to go up or is export going to go down? If the currency is appreciating, gaining in its value. I want to lead us. <laughs> well, I guess it's going to go down. Absolutely. It's going to go down because now your products are costing more. Now, on the top of all of that, it's not that your products are costing more, but on the top of all of that, your main competitor, who is Brazil, is devaluating its currency. So that means that first, your currency is going up, meaning all your products are more expensive. Your first neighbor, Brazil, much bigger than you, but basically you are exporting the same things to international markets, devaluated its currency. So your products are going to be even more expensive. And at that point, Argentina said, we can't continue to keep this currency board going 
to link our currency to dollar, it's costing our economy too much. We cannot, we cannot export, we cannot be competitive. And as such, we are actually going down and down and down. And so at that point, basically, Argentina said, we cannot continue this currency board. Very, very terrible consequences on their economy with unemployment rising above 20%, in inflation rate 20% on a monthly basis. And they pretty much, uh -huh. on the top of all of that, they have some internal, uh, how to put, uh, characteristics of their own market. And that is that uh, a lack of fiscal discipline uh, they were not supposed to spend from their budget more money that they can actually make, but they actually start spending more because if you think about 20% of your people are unemployed, then you think, okay, I have to do something to help those people without jobs, and then they start printing more money. Yes. Uh, why they couldn't establish another one reserve? currency, like link the peso with the euro, for example, or something like that? Well, for very simple re reason, I mean, that doesn't work that fast. You know, in order to establish a currency board, uh, it's actually quite a sophisticated procedure that a lot of steps need to be followed. And uh, in any event, uh, you know, their economy is not that much linked to Europe as much as it's linked to, to U.S. And that, that's another reason as well. But it, it's not like, you know, I'm going to, you know, buy new shoes and I can do that fast. I mean, this really requires a much more, much more preparation and all of that. And again, Argentina pretty much was not able to fulfill its obligation and they defaulted. And now the final lessons from this part that I would like to come up with are those following. Number one is, um, you remember when we were talking about culture, that I mentioned that one of the characteristics of culture uh, is actually uh, time. Different cultures have different perception about time. And so in economics, it's also very, very important to make distinction between long term and short term. And in this particular case that is relevant for to tonight's presentation, uh, long term basically here means the following. In the long term, the value of the currency is going to be impacted by the economic fundamentals of that particular country. Economic fundamentals are gross domestic product, unemployment, inflation, uh, balance of payment, uh, government budget. So in the long term, all of those factors are going to influence the value of the currency. However, in the short term, speculations can have an enormous impact of the value of the currency. Today, we have, uh, if we combine the money of International Monetary Fund, the, their whole budget is not sufficient to defend currencies in the world. So what I want to say, uh, theoretically, if we have a speculative attack on the currency, uh, individual central banks are not able to defend their own currencies. So short-term speculators have a lot of power and uh, 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 currency traders have a lot of power to move the currency in one way or another. And in situations like that, when we have, particularly nowadays, when you have all of those sophisticated uh, softwares all around the world, where you can, in a matter of less than a second, <laughs> or a second change the money few times, buying and selling different currencies, 
by doing that, you are changing the value of that currency. Uh, in situations like that, when you have panic on the market, what we have is that people want to get out of that currency that is losing value as fast as possible. And that, again, can actually trigger and bring us to this last point that I have here, self-fulfilling prophecy. So we are thinking that the currency is going to lose the value. By panicking, by selling the currency, we are actually making that really happen. That's what it means, self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, before I go there, uh, there, I want to stop here and then I want to start from the beginning. So, any questions at this point that you may have? Do you have some sections that are maybe not clear and you would like me to explain or anything that comes to your mind related to those topics? Or maybe later. So, now, can I go to the beginning? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Tonight's presentation was and is about international monetary systems. I, I started this way by introducing those very powerful stories about those few serious, actually, international financial crises. And then I'm going to explain you, actually, what international monetary systems are and what are those different ways that we have that the governments can conduct their exchange rate policies. So international monetary system is basically covering everything that is dealing with payments, with investments, and exchange rates. There are certain rules and regulations that need to be uh, followed. There are certain policies and all of that. When we talk about systems, that means it's not one country. It's not two countries. When we talk about international monetary systems, we are thinking about the world as a whole. And all of those are the systems in evolution of the international monetary system. We first have that uh, gold and silver will use before 1875. Then from 1875 to 1914, we have that the gold standard was used. From 1915 to 44, we have uh, the period between two wars. Uh, then we have Bretton Woods system, 1945 and 1972. And then finally, we have a collapse of Bretton Woods system. And since that, 1973 to pr present, we actually have a flexible exchange rate. Now, let's try to understand each of those and the characteristics of each of those. One system that we can talk about is a floating exchange rate system. What does that mean? That means that the value of the currency, the exchange rate of the currency, is basically made on the market by demand and supply. If somebody is more demanding our rubla, what is the value of rubla going to be? So there are more and more people demanding, I want to buy rubla, I want to buy rubla. What's going to happen with the value of ruble? Going up or down? It's going up. Absolutely, it's going up. And again, the reverse thing is if somebody starts selling, 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 the value is going down. So that will be the floating exchange rate. Then we have something that is called a peg exchange rate. Interesting terms combined. Basically, what pegged means, now I'm going to select one currency. And I'm going to link peg my value of my exchange rate to that currency. So if that currency goes up, my currency goes up. If that currency goes down, my currency goes down. The reason why some countries are choosing this peg exchange rate is because they want to kind of borrow credibility of that stronger currency. And that's why they're using peg exchange rate. Now, something that is not a dirty dancing, but it's dirty float. And a dirty float basically means I'm going to let 
currency fluctuate. But actually, I am going to defend it if it happens to be that I have to defend. It. So that's what I call dirty float. It's really not really float all the time, but when I see that the currency is having some troubles, I will defend it. And then finally, we have an, a fixed exchange rate, which basically means I am, like Thailand said, I'm going to keep my currency fixed to the dollar, and there will be no fluctuation, which means that in the situation of fixed exchange rate, government has to defend a currency. What does it mean to defend the currency? How can you defend the value of the currency not to go down? First, when is the currency going to go down? When everyone sells it. Okay, exactly. And now, how are we going to defend as the currency? To support your currency, you should, first of all, sell some dollars or euro in, in Russian case, and then buy a rubble. So basically, you are buying your own currency. You are buying, you remember the peso crisis. The government was buying their own currency in order to keep that value high. So that's what it means. You have to defend your currency, and you're defending your currency by using your foreign reserves to buy on international market that currency. Okay? Very good. Now, the gold standard... Uh, I'm sure that you heard a lot about this, uh, uh, but in general, we have that every currency is linked to gold and a certain value of gold. And uh, that was, in a certain way, providing uh, stability in uh, economic systems that uh, stimulating trade between countries, because if there is any disbalance, that will be paid by, uh, by gold and all of those things. But what was happening is in gold standard, you have to keep, again, that exchange rate, that price of your rubla, of your dollar, to a certain quantity of gold. Now, if you start printing more and more money and you're keeping the same value, that really is not the same value of expressed in gold. And in the situation when countries are going through very difficult times, like wars, countries really like to print a lot of money because they need a lot of money for, uh, for defense or for war. In a sense, you know, you need ammunition, uh, you need boots for your soldiers, you need all of those things. So there is a lot, a lot, a lot of spending. And again, each time when we have a lot, a lot, a lot of spending, inflation is going up. So we have that this gold standard more or less collapsed uh, in the case in the situation of Great Depression. And then before that, we have this kind of in between wars <laughs> situation where I want to emphasize this one that actually every country. Nobody was thinking about international monetary system. Nobody was thinking about the world as a whole. Everybody was thinking about themselves. What I need to do for my country, for, for my people in this particular situation. So if I have to defend my country by printing more money, I'm going to print more money. I'm going to forget about all those international rules and regulations that international monetary system requires you to obey by. And then we have this uh, Bretton Woods system, and I think that we did mention Bretton Woods system a few classes before. But in general, we created uh, a Bretton Woods system with those 44 countries at the beginning, and uh, the whole purpose was after the war, after the Second World War, after the devastating consequences that uh, both wars had on the economies and people in the world, there was all of those intentions to try to avoid any other devastating war. And there was an idea that if we promote trade between countries, that we will actually make them more dependent on each other. And as such, there will be less chances that they will be fighting each other. And as you can see here, 
what we had is that we had something that is called quasi gold standard. Why? Because not all currencies were linked to gold. All currencies were linked to dollar. But dollar was the one who was linked to gold. So all of those currencies, German mark at the time, British pound and French franc, they were actually linked to dollar. And their value can fluctuate plus minus 10%. So they can that fluctuate. However, dollar cannot fluctuate. Dollar, the value of dollar was linked to gold, meaning pegged for $35 per one ounce of gold. And that was given. At the same time, we established those two important financial institutions. One is International Monetary Fund, and another one is World Bank or International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And then we go to see this video, and then we will actually explain what happened here. The third indispensable element in building the new prosperity is closely related to creating new jobs and halting inflation. We must protect the position of the American dollar as a pillar of monetary stability around the world. In the past seven years, there's been an average of one international monetary crisis every year. Now, who gains from these crises? Not the working man, not the investor, not the real producers of wealth. The gainers are the international money speculators. Because they thrive on crises, they help to create them. In recent weeks, the speculators have been waging an all-out war on the American dollar. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Now, what is this action, which is very technical, what does it mean for you? Let me lay to rest the bugaboo of what is called devaluation. If you want to buy a foreign car or take a trip abroad, market conditions may cause your dollar to buy slightly less. But if you are among the overwhelming majority of Americans who buy American-made products in America, your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. The effect of this action, in other words, will be to stabilize the dollar. Now, this action will not win us any friends among the international money traders. But our primary concern is with the American workers and with fair competition around the world. To our friends abroad, including the many responsible members of the international banking community who are dedicated to stability and the flow of trade, I give this assurance. The United States has always been and will continue to be a forward-looking and trustworthy trading partner. In full cooperation with the International Monetary Fund and those who trade with us, we will press for the necessary reforms to set up an urgently needed new international monetary system. Stability and equal treatment is in everybody's best interest. I am determined that the American dollar must never again be a hostage in the hands of international speculators. I'm taking one further step to protect the dollar, to improve our balance of payments, and to increase jobs for Americans. As a temporary measure, I am today opposed, imposing an additional tax of 10% on goods imported into the United States. This is a better solution for international trade than direct controls on the amount of imports. This import tax is a temporary action. It isn't directed against any other country. It's an action to make certain that American products will not be at a disadvantage because of unfair exchange rates. When the unfair treatment is ended, 
the import tax will end as well. As a result of these actions, the product of American labor will be more competitive, and the unfair edge that some of our foreign competition has will be removed. This is a major reason why our trade balance has eroded over the past 15 years. Okay, I think that this is actually a very powerful uh, address uh, that the uh, President of the United States gave to the United States people, but at the same time to the rest of the world. And by this particular uh, video and in this particular way, he basically um, destroyed the, the international monetary of a system called Bretton Woods. From that day on, we didn't don't have any longer uh, that quasi gold standard. We don't have any longer that currencies get fluctuate plus minus 10 percent uh, as uh, the crisis in uh, Mexico and in Southeast Asia and in Argentina and in Russia showed the exchange rate can actually fluctuate 50 percent, 17 percent. The currencies can lose their value in a matter of uh, minutes. 50%. Overnight, the value can go 50%. So from that day on, we are now in the, in, the, in, the, in the international monetary system with actually mostly floating and flexible exchange rates. But uh, somebody can ask, uh, why did he do this when he did it? So we have that uh, this Bretton Woods started in 1945, but uh, it ended in 1972. Why 1972? Why 1955? Why not in 1960? Why not in 1965? Why 1972? Ex excellent, excellent, Constantin. Absolutely in Vietnam. So what is that link? How is Vietnam linked to this exchange rate? <laughs> it's just that time of the... <laughs> The U.S. government started the war in uh, Vietnam, and this is why, but I don't really, no, I don't know how yet. Okay, so what is the link? Well, you remember that I said each time in the, uh, when we have war, what are governments doing? Printing a lot of money, having inflation. If we have inflation, we don't have any longer $35 per one ounce of gold. We have to have it, but listen to this. All the prices in the economy, starting with uh, the gas, starting with cars, starting with what you eat, what you drink, where you sleep, all of that is going up because of inflation. The only price that is staying st stable is the exchange rate. Is actually the exchange rate dollar to gold. Now, you have to understand also the, the, the whole history of all of this. How did we get here? Uh, after the Second World War, United States was the one uh, who was mostly exporting to the rest of the world. And obviously, uh, it was requiring uh, dollars in return, you know, everything to be paid in dollars. However, as the other countries in the world started to recover, from the devastating consequences of the Second World War, they also started then to produce. When they were producing, they were starting eventually to sell and export abroad. So they start actually now exporting to the United States. And as President Nixon was referring, we United States actually entered in a phase that was having a trade deficit. What does that mean? It was having a trade deficit because it was exporting less and importing more. Now, when you have all of this combined, you have now a lot of people with a lot of dollars, uh, but they were then thinking like, uh, if you have something, uh, if you have a lot of something, that means that that something is actually losing the value in general. And so they start doubting, is this $35 per ounce of gold really going to hold? Or is 
United States going to devaluate. Now, you also have to take into consideration the following that um, if all other prices are going up, maybe the simplest solution would be why don't we increase the price of gold? So it's not any longer going to be $35 per ounce of gold, let it be $39 per ounce of gold. What's the problem with that? So why do you think that we didn't, United States didn't actually increase the price of gold? Why they didn't do that? Think about always like, okay, if something is going to happen, who is going to benefit and who is going to be hurt? And then figure it out, aha, uh -huh, if those people are going to benefit, do I really want them to benefit? So who can benefit if the prices of gold will go up? Immediately, who is going to benefit? Sorry? Why will somebody who have a dollar benefit if the price of gold goes up? <laughs> Very good. Why Soviet Union? Absolutely. So number one, Soviet Union is going to benefit because the prices of gold is going up. And whoever is then buying gold will have to pay a higher price. Who else is going to benefit? Who is the other great producer of gold? South Africa. Yes, you quit that on South Africa, but you see how it can be handy now. Yes, South Africa. You have to understand that at the time, obviously, uh, the United States and Soviet Union were not necessarily the best friends. And so obviously it wasn't in interest of the United States to support its own not best friend. And at the same time, South uh, Africa, uh, well, in South Africa, the, the international sanctions were opposed uh, against apartheid system that they actually conducted there. So that was immediately no way that it's going to happen. And it really didn't happen. So as a consequence, instead, we have that the uh, United States withdraw convertibility of a dollar to, to gold, and we have the end of, of this uh, system. Mm, okay, that one. And as President Nixon pointed out, there was another grouping in Jamaica, and basically at that point they said, okay, we have to recognize that the system now is floating, and we gold has been completely uh, abandoned as a reserve asset, and international monetary quota system was increased. So those are all now the, the, the things that were happening since then. And you can see it on this table. Basically, you're seeing um, the fluctuation of US dollar in those different times. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we go again to this one. But I want to end. Uh, can we go to the end? Murat? Okay, this will be slower. But I just want to complete this whole thing that... Uh, I just want to finish with, with this presentation because you can see here today, um, those are the, the member, uh, international monetary funding member countries, and what this pie is basically showing us that uh, managed float, the most, most countries in the world are basically using managed float. And then, uh, uh, sorry, uh, fixed peg, fixed peg, and then managed float. And then uh, we have very few countries are using currency board. And we have a free float is 14%. So as you can see here, we don't have one international monetary system. We have many, because in the past when I was talking about we have gold, we have, uh, uh, you know, like quasi gold standard, we have Bretton Woods, that was one for the whole world. Now we have a lot of those different one systems used. And as you can imagine, again, that uh, all of this is bringing a little bit more uncertainty in trade and in finance, because the the exchange rates are much more volatile, and as such, uh, you can really lose and gain a lot 
with the movement of exchange rates. And I think I will end here. So thank you so much for tonight. And then I hope to see you on Thursday where our students are going to present interesting countries. And then you can learn about all of that. Thank you so much. Good night.